robots without fences. Well, that is a topic that implies quite a lot of applications. And in this webinar, we will actually not be focusing on neither mobile platforms or AGVs, which is a kind of a robot that obviously doesn't use fences, but it's not focusing on the topic of collaborative robots or cobots either. Instead, we are going to look at the application of what we would call a standard robot without fences around it. What is possible to do and what can I possibly gain of by doing so? So, I've made a small example for us to follow through this webinar. And to be overly clear, the example is a bit exaggerated. So therefore, I've also chosen the largest robot we have, the Titan. Uh, but basically, we have a standard robot bolted to a concrete floor. And this robot will then, in this case, obviously have a certain reach, a maximum reach, together with its two land work piece. This I have marked on the floor as a, this red circle. And the typical application for handling the safety of this cell is basically that we put a fence slightly outside the maximum reach of the robot and its tool with some monitored access points, in this case, uh, safety doors. This is still what's the absolute most common application we find. And I think you all recognize it very well. And the basic principle here is to keep the operator outside of the working area at all times. And if the operator or a service person needs to enter their working area, that will cause a safe stop of the cell. And on the upside, this is a well-known, a very common safety solution. Uh, and uh, widely accepted such. The risk assessment which requires to be done is quite straight straightforward and easy to be done. But there are also some drawbacks with this solution. As you see, the footprint of such a cell would be quite big. It covers an area which, as long as we keep the cell square, as I've done, is actually significantly larger than even the maximum reach of the robots. Uh, so I get a lot of unused space. And floor space is, with many, many customers, a big issue. Then it's actually comparatively project intensive. Obviously, I need to buy in and install or assemble the safety fence. But not only that, uh, I need actually to do some design to do it. Uh, I have to do a, at least a mechanical overview, something like I've done here. Uh, installed, I already mentioned, but uh, since there are safety doors, I have some wiring to do, uh, which I also need to put into electrical drawings. And there is some small amount of programming involved to create the safe stop from the signals of the door. And finally, it's a very inflexible solution because the solution is literally bolted to the floor. It's quite a lot of job to change the layout of the cell if I need to do that. So, what can I do to go forward? Could I? put the cell fence tighter towards the robot? Well, 
I could do, but that wouldn't really be allowed because, and this is one of the reasons I've chosen the large Titan robot, because this is strong enough, so it really didn't wouldn't matter in this case because the robot will either hit or actually, in this case, probably smash through the fences. So I can still do that, but I would need additional safety features or safety components here. I could limit the axis movements, which in this view is difficult to do in sufficient range, but I can also use our safe operation uh, software option to do this. And some of you may have show, seen the safe operation webinar we did some weeks back, but a one screen reminder of what it is, is actually that it monitors the ranges and the axis of the robot and we can also create the tool virtually. And then I can create a space where the robot is allowed to move, which is smaller than the actual reach of the robot. And this is a safety function reaching category three or PLD, if you like. And I also, as I mentioned, define the size of the tool and workpiece to make that included in the calculation of how the robot may move. I can also control the maximum velocity of the movement within this box and actually vary it depending on outer circumstances. And integrated into the safe operation function is also a function which is called breaking before range limits. making it possible for the robot to always look forward in its movement and ensure that the breaking of the movement starts before it actually hits the virtual workspace limits limitations. So it will slow down and break before it exits the allowed box, if you like. Now, by using this software option, I can now create a an maximum allowed working space using safe operation inside this box. And hereby create a cell which has, compared to my prior example, a significantly smaller footprint. But still, it's the traditional safety solution using an outside fence with monitored access points, which has the same benefits as before, because it's of course also a much smaller footprint than my old example. But we still have the drawbacks we mentioned earlier, that it needs to be installed and documented in all the various documentation levels required, and it is still a very fixed solution. So, is it possible to remove the fence completely? And the simple answer is absolutely not. Not without adding additional safety components to this. Although the robot in this case still won't move, outside the limitations we've set up for it. The operator is still free to move into this working area without the robot noticing, if you like to speak. So there are several ways of doing this, but one simple way is to use some kind of laser scanners or laser, laser light curtains. But in this case, where I have a pretty extreme application, a robot standing on a naked floor without really any equipment around it, I've chosen to use a laser scanner. And one thing to keep in mind when I choose a laser scanner solution is that I need 
a scanner that covers an area which is larger than the reach of the robot. That means that marked in yellow in this page, there is an additional safety zone. And how large this is, is basically governed by the standard ISO 10218-2. And we will get back to that a little bit later. Any questions so far? If not, now, obviously in this case, to in order to cover the complete working area of the robot, I need two scanners. And in this case, since they cover more than 180 degrees angle, they are also a bit overlapping. But that is how I get the complete coverage in this application case. So the first scanner will cover this area and the second scanner will cover this area so we have also have overlapping so any restrictions i point in the overlapping area needs to be configured in both scanners in this case now doing it like this i get some new features compared to the old uh, it is a safe operate solution to do it like this. The risk assessment is still fairly easy, but on the other hand, it's now a little bit more complex than the old uh, compared to using a fence. And one thing is come back. I've actually now again increased the footprint of the cell because I've added this extra safe zone outside of the reach of the robot. But on the other hand, I have much less installation work to do because this is a software solution together with two scanners, which in this case are mounted on the robot base itself. They don't have to be mounted on the robot cell itself. A robot, of, it could be mounted anywhere you like as long as it covers or restricts an operator from entering the work area unnoticed. And this is also a very flexible solution. And we will now look at how we can create this flexibility in terms of application. So if you remember, we made a smaller square work. So that was what we wanted to create. And using the scanners and the reach of the robot, we have a circular work area. Now, using safe operation and also defining the monitored zones in the scanner, we can now create a, a box monitored zone, which is still larger than the operation zone of the robot. But it, we have now get rid of the circular uh, situation we saw before. So now we have a smaller footprint than before, still slightly larger than if I would put a fence directly close outside the working area. But I have a significantly less project effort because I don't have to install a fence and I have still have a flexible solution. Now, if I take this one step further, Safe operation also allows, gives us the possibility to create monitored spaces within the work zone, which restricts the robot from going into these monitored spaces. And these monitored spaces can be either static or dynamic uh, controls through safe inputs to the robot controller, depending on different events outside of the robot cell. Now these monitored spaces have to then, if I want to use them, I have to define them both in safe operation 
but I probably will have to handle them also in the scanner applications or in the scanner zone. I have to define them as zones also in the scanners. So this could look very much like this. In this case, I've created two of these monitored spaces. And I've created one green box here, as I see, where I intend to have a static monitor space, basically saying that the robot is never allowed to move into this because I'm going to, in, in the argument of saving some space, put a static object here. But I also have a dynamic zone created here, which is the orange box here. And for some reason or another, in my example application, an operator needs to enter this zone safely from time to time. Now, by using this safe operation feature, I actually can optimize the use of space. So if I do what I told you just now, it could look like this. In this case, if I remove the zones and just look at the reality, what in fact is, is that I've placed some other machinery inside this safe box because the robot never needs to move here. So it's okay me and the robot won't smash into this machinery and i'm also allowing an operator to entering a specific zone of the work area here and when the operator is in this zone the robot can continue whatever work it's doing over here but it may not move into this zone which is activated by the scanner and a digital input to the robot controller Hereby, I create a cell with a much smaller footprint in reality, a very flexible solution, which I can redesign with much less effort than the a static fence solution. And all changes would then be handled through software, not really through a physical installation or Now, we've already mentioned that we need an additional safe zone outside the operation zone. And the question is then, how large does this safe zone or safe distance needs to be? And this is generically handled by the ISO 10218-2, which handles the robot system and integration of the safety systems. And here you can find a generic calculation, uh, which is based on basically the stopping time of the robot. If we order the robot to like, safe stop, how what is the time before it is at a complete standstill? And that in turn, of course, is a factor of braking force, its own mass, the mass of the load, and the speed of its movement. We also have to take in consideration the reaction time of the system here. And that's not only the robot controller itself. In this case, within this example we've talked about here, we have to take the reaction time of the scanner. We'll, we do require a safe PLC, which activates and deactivates the safe inputs that I talked about and the robot controller itself. So we need to have considered the maximum complete reaction time for this. We also have to consider the approach speed of the operator uh, when approaching the cell, if he is going to walk into this area or not. And finally, we also have, have to have some additional safety margin here because the operator can be reaching over, so to speak, or extending an arm or a leg into the zone. So an additional safety margin in this is required. And that is how this speed, which is this distance, which is what we, from the yellow edge of the yellow field to the actual working area of the robot, how long this distance needs to be is defined by this calculation.
Now, there is actually one more feature we could employ by using this technology and safe operation. We could actually, in the safety zone, sorry, create two different areas, one outer and one inner area, which means that we have an outer warning zone. So if an operator enters this light yellow field, the robot will react in such a way that it will continue its operation, but with its lower speed. And in reality, what we are creating then is that if the operator then enters the stop zone, the dark yellow field, the stop time of the robot will be shorter because the speed is lower. Therefore, we have differentiate this zone and actually make the working area for the operator a bit more flexible than it was before. Questions so far? And in this example, following my example is what do I need to create such a solution? Well, obviously I need the robot and the robot controller. I don't think it's a big surprise there. I need two laser scanners with, and since I had some equipment and I had an operator entering the safe zone, I need a laser scanner which allows me to define zones inside the monitored spaces. These should preferably be connected through a field bus, so for example, a Profinet, to a safe PLC. This could be a safe PLC of any kind. This is obviously a Beckhoff PLC for those, but it could be a Siemens or whatever, which then sets safe outputs, and therefore safe inputs, to the KUKA controller, which then handles the robot. And the connection between here could be also Profinet or Ethercat or whatever. A safe bus is required since we are using safe inputs. And basically, if this is the only safety components we're going to install in a KUKA cabinet, there's actually space enough to mount a small safety PLC and take the 24 volts from within the robot controller to supply both PLCs and the safety scanner, if we like. So this is the basic setup we need to create the following fenceless uh, solution, which I've described here. And that pretty much summarizes how to create a fenceless application. And we do have one final statement before we leave. Come on. PowerPoint, please. Go on. And that is regardless if we are setting up a robot cell with a fence or without a, sense, a fence. And that is that in any event, it's not just a question of buying the required components. There are some additional work required to create these safety features. Even in the most simple cases we and where we have a fence and with doors, there are some configuration or programming creating safe entrance to the cell. And regardless if we have a fence or not, the integrator always have the following obligations. That a risk assessment always has to be carried out and properly documented. And in the same way, the risk assessment has to be verified and validated. And this also has to be documented at the end of the day. So in these two first points, I think most of us are quite used of doing this, but I've seen many cases where we miss, uh, miss out a bit on the documentation of this. Uh, and of course, the individual components that we are using to create our solutions have to be integrated in accordance with relevant standards. 
and installed according to the supplier instructions. And finally, we also have to take in consideration whatever applicable laws or regulations, which can be local, are required as well. That will also affect our standards. So this small webinar is not a generic solution of just do it like this and you're safe. In each case, we all have to do these steps to create this 